Uh, it is my pleasure and, and happy uh, task to introduce Jana Hacharik, who um, I've known for a long time. She was born and raised in Barrow, Alaska, very knowledgeable about um, hunting and fishing and gathering on the, on the land. She and her family are longtime users of, of the many uh, resources in the North Slope. And she's um, very well known, served on boards in Barrow and statewide and, and nationally, haven't you? I think nationally as well. But um, for the last 14 years, she has worked for the North Slope Borough School District uh, with a program introducing and, and incorporating the knowledge of elders into the school programs and into the curriculum. And before that, she was director of the North Slope Borough History, Language, and Culture Commission. And so you can see she's got a, a very good background for today's talk which is entitled Reclaiming Traditional Spirituality. So with my pleasure is to introduce Jana. Thank you. Kuyanak. Kuyanak. Kuyagipsi mani juminyakapsi na alaganinyaklusi sa vaptigun sa makulayak to awdi niya kapsi uvlupag uvanga pausarak Jana Harcharik utkayakwing mi urunga inyugunga runga utkayakwing ni Good afternoon. It's my distinct pleasure to uh, speak before you today. I would like to thank uh, Rosita and Sea um, Alaska Heritage in Institute for the invitation. My name is uh, Pausarak, a name given to me by my grandfather, otherwise known as Jana Harcharik. As Chuck indicated, I've been uh, with the school district uh, for 14 years, and, and I have to admit I had a nice PowerPoint already for this presentation, and my computer uh, decided it, it was going to take a mind of its own, so I'm resorting to uh, a, another one that I've done um, that'll get us to the same place, which is where um, I wanted to be at the end of the hour. Um, so today I, wa I want to address some of the things that we've done at least on the north slope that that is getting us to a place where we can begin the what seems to be on the appearance the daunting task of reclaiming our traditional spirituality and I'm going to provide you an example of how we're doing that in an educational context given the work that we're doing to do given the work we're doing to align our curriculum and to articulate a coherent curriculum for the North Slope Borough School District through the lenses of the Inupiat. <clears throat> Nuances associated with traditional spirituality continue to be oppressed as a result of Christian and other uh, very strong influences. And so in this presentation, I'll speak about efforts to effect change to make the mere discussion of traditional religion acceptable for purposes of setting the stage for the reclamation of traditional spirituality more widespread in the Inupiaq region. And I'm going to start by sharing with you the work that we're doing at the school district to incorporate um, culture, quote unquote, I, I don't like using that word necessarily, uh, but our life ways into, into our schooling, in, 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 uh, particularly as it relates to content but I also wanted to share a couple of notes about uh, um, some other aspects that we're also incorporating into the conduct of, of schooling. Back in 2006 and 2007, we had been operating under, um, as, as, as a school district with local control and had been operating the school district with local control for more than 30 years. And it was in 2006 and 2007 that we were able to convince the uh, the administ then administration, that as a district we had never gone to our people to ask them what was important to them and what their vision was for schools and schooling in their communities. And so we barked on what we called the Inupiaq Education Initiative, which meant that we traveled to each of the communities for several days at a time. And through those efforts, we were able to go back to where we had been 
before schools were ever established, before missions ever came to the Arctic, North Slope in particular, and confer with our elders about what it is and how it is and what it is that we did to instill beliefs, to instill the sense of being a contributing member of society before schools ever came. So we re-embraced the idea that as a people we were able to raise our children to be contributing productive adults and members of society replete with all of the beliefs that came with. We then had to acknowledge uh, history as it came about as a result of the establishment of schools on the, on the North Slope, as, as has been the case with many indigenous peoples uh, across the world. The attempt um, through education was to, was to assimilate the Inupiat into um, mainstream society and, and a variety of, of methods were used including the oppression of language, the oppression of spiritual beliefs, the oppression of song and dance, which um, resulted in, in a varying degrees of, of success on, the part of, on their part. Our language uh, today, uh, we have to, um, we have had to do many things in order to instill language in our, in our children. We're on the brink of, we were on the brink of our language becoming extinct. Our youngest speakers are in their late, getting to be in their mid 50s. And so we've had to do uh, some, some very innovative things to create excitement about the language. The other thing that we had to acknowledge was that when schools came, we, and trusted our children into, into the lives of the teachers. And we believed that the teachers would raise our children to be the contributing productive adults that we had been able to do historically. And of course, that has not been the case. Along the way, we've lost language. We've lost our traditional um, spiritual beliefs. Uh, but I, th I think there. They, they continued to be vestiges of them um, in, in the memories of our elders. Um, we also had to speak about the boarding school experience and all of the havoc that that era wreaked on our people because it meant that probably more than 50% of a of a, of a said community, I'll, I'll use Point Lay as an example, would all of a sudden be gone from the community for years in some cases, and certainly for nine months out of a school year, which, which meant there was an interruption. There was a disruption in parenting. There was a disruption in the communication that was had between, between the elders and the parents and the children of our communities. And we continue to, um, how shall I put it, we continue to deal with the aftermath associated with that era. The pathologies that have resulted as a result of that era are, are, are far too numerous for me to, to, to expound on here, here for purposes of this talk. Suffice it to say that the um, problems that we deal with socially with alcohol abuse and drug abuse and domestic violence are symptoms the way I perceive it uh, of that era and so um, the Inupiaq Education Initiative I think really helped kickstart us into a, a healing mode, uh, a mode in which we we were able to re-embrace traditional beliefs and the work that we're doing at the district um, embraces that philosophy as well. What we heard from our people once we had acknowledged our history was their vision for their schools. And as a result of that, the Inupiaq Learning Framework was born and I'm going to speak very quickly about that if I can figure out how to work this. What do we click it to go forward? Or this one? Mm -hmm. 
uh, this PowerPoint, as I indicated earlier, was done for another, um, another session. Uh, but very quickly, the Inupiaq Education Initiative, uh, we, we, we embarked on that journey as, as a way to begin building trust between the schools and the communities. <coughs> we had been existing with this, with this mantra of, you know, the schools do their thing and that's what they do over there. And this is what we do as a community. So we've very consciously been putting a lot of effort into into creating a sense of ownership in education in our people and, and, and embedded in that, as, as, as I'll relate to you here in a few minutes, is, are the spiritual aspects. The Elinyarnikuna um, Prosiokti Trail Breakers for Learning uh, was a group of people that we uh, put together soon after the Inupiaq Education Initiative was formed to work with us on on defining what a well-grounded, well-educated 18-year-old today looks like. There were 10 members from across the district uh, comprised of elders, middle generations, and, and younger generations because we wanted to ensure that, that the work that we did um, was a representation across the generations. We gathered, um, they gathered four times during the 2009-2010 school year and the uh, prompts um, that we used included um, the knowledge that one needs to be able to truly live as an Inupiaq today and what this well-educated, well-grounded uh, person looks like today. And these are the questions that we asked over the series of, of the four gatherings to arrive at what became a very comprehensive list of Inupiaq knowledge and skills that one should have uh, in today's day and age given that uh, we exist in a global society anymore. We don't, we're not, we're not a people who are frozen in time. As a result of that work then we were able to ask um, Rainey Hobson who is from Point Hope. She's, uh, she's a very uh, prolific, um, very talented artist and we tasked her with taking this uh, pages and pages of Inupiaq knowledge and skills and arriving at an image that depicted uh, everything that these lists entailed. And so she came up with, with our blanket of life. Our blanket of life. Probably most of you know that we celebrate a uh, successful whale catch with a blanket toss, and this is the blanket that uh, is represented, representative of that. You'll note that the blanket is surrounded by eight sets of two individuals, symbolic of the eight communities that, that are on the North Slope. You'll note that one of the other of the two is lighter than, than the other, and that is to honor and embrace our ancestors who are with us even today and will always be with us. We will be the ancestors of tomorrow's children. You'll note that each of the individuals is holding the blanket and the, the handles on the blanket are of a certain um, sort of a ochre color. The handles on the blanket are representative is, is iconic of our spiritual nature. Our spirituality is part of who we are. It is not separate and distinct. And so it surrounds everything that's in or on the blanket. You'll also note that the stitching on the blanket is, is red. The stitching on the blanket is what holds the blanket together. And the stitching on the blanket is representative of our language. Our language is what holds all of the pieces that are intertwined on the blanket together. You'll, you noted on the blanket that there, are, that there were four quadrants, if you will, um, the first of which is the environmental realm, and I'm going to go through these very quickly because I want to share with you how we were able to embed the spiritual pieces into the curriculum work that we're doing at the district. In the environmental realm, Celia is a concept that I've never been able to translate into English. It's a relationship that we have 
with the world around us. It's, it can also be referred to as the weather, but, but as individuals and as people, we have a relationship with Celia. And so the environment uh, is, is, is very, very important. In the environmental realm, then, we're going to um, delve into what we're calling core themes, the first of which uh, is food preparation and care, and all of the beliefs associated with food preparation and care. And I'm going to show you some examples of how, that, how that's embodied in the uh, work that we're doing uh, with the curriculum. Hunting and survival, critical piece that we continue uh, to practice today. We were very fortunate this fall and um, uh, we're, we were able to bring in and land 20 bowhead whales. So we're going to have a very, very good Thanksgiving and Christmas. Sewing, uh, very, um, very important to be able to know how to sew. It could mean life or death when you're out hunting in the middle of winter and it's 40 below and blowing 20 miles an hour. Tools, tools of today as well as the tools of yesterday. The group uh, felt, yes, it's important for our children to learn about the ingenuity of our ancestors in that they were able to utilize the limited resources that were, that were available uh, and fashion them into the tools needed to be able to survive back in the day before the foreigners ever came. Um, but it's also important for them to know the tools of today, the, the iPads and the computers and the who knows what they're going to come up with in the future. Medicines and healing, this, this was on the verge of, of, of petering out, of dying out, of people forgetting what, what it is that we used for medicines and healing. And so we were able to uh, work with the group and, and they identified this as a very, very, very critical part of, that makes up who we are as a people. And again, getting back to Celia and the environment and the relationship that we have with the environment. Um, the North Slope is comprised of 89,000 square miles from the uh, Beaufort and Chukchi seas on the Arctic Ocean down to the Brooks Range from the west in Point Hope to the east near the Canadian border and the community of Kaktovik. That's uh, um, the picture you see is, is Kulio. He's, uh, he's our youngest whaling captain in Barrow and he's standing on a, uh, on a very high point to see if there are whales on the horizon moving towards him. Community realm is a very, very uh, critical uh, part of the blanket of life. As, community, as a community, we are responsible for raising our children and re-embracing that ideology has, has been a very, very uh, important factor in, in the work that, that we're doing. In the community realm, we honor our elders from whom knowledge emanates. This is um, Rhoda Aguk from Anaktuvuk Pass, very, very dear, dear, dear elder. Ceremonies and celebrations, including the marriage ceremonies of today, including the messenger feast, the ceremonies of yesterday, and the rituals associated with those ceremonies. Singing and dancing. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, there was an attempt uh, on the part of, of missionaries to, to eradicate um, song and dance. And fortunately, uh, we had some very strong people who who were able to convince the powers that be in the church at the time that either they let up on their attempt to uh, eradicate it or nobody's going to come to church. And so today we're, ab we're able to practice song and dance as a result of the, that very, very strong belief. Some of the stories that I've heard about ha having to go underground are, are just uh, unfathomable. Storytelling, um, given that we have to deal with uh, language issues of today where the elders are the speakers of the language and the young people are non-speakers and English speakers, um, we've had to be very conscious in, in the way 
in, in the work that we do to, to reclaim the art of storytelling, it has become um, um, very decayed, I guess you might be able to say, um, given the language situation. Um, and as an oral, traditionally having been an oral people, we're doing everything we can to, to, to make it strong once again. The arts, traditional arts, contemporary arts. Parenting was a very uh, important piece that, that the group spoke about given there had been that interruption through the, uh, as a result of the boarding school era where we have to uh, reclaim um, and, and become strong again as a, in, in our role as parents, as grandparents. Traditional games, <clears throat> these are my granddaughters, by the way. And our relationships, we love to be related to one another. There's, um, and if we're not related, we'll find a way to become related. <laughs> In the historical realm, this, this was a really, really uh, a, a cry that we heard from our communities that um, we need to be teaching our own history and not only be teaching our own history, but teaching it from our perspective. Our children, uh, I, I, I had opportunity to teach a group of high school students uh, several years ago, and I showed them a film that we had produced that uh, depicted the protest that was uh, had back in 1961 when it was Ill illegal for us to hunt ducks when they were on the North Slope, but legal when they were gone. Um, and and it's, it's a, uh, an episode that was called uh, The Duck Inn. And I was showing this film to, to, to high school students and I, and I was watching their reaction and it dawned on me that there might, I, it, it made me question how many of them knew uh, about our regional corporation. So uh, after the film, I asked them, I said, what, how many of you know what ASRC stands for? Or, or who can tell me what ASRC stands for? And they're going, um, Arctic, Arctic, and this was just several years ago, Arctic something. And then, and then my next question was, and so how much are your dividends going to be? And they knew to a penny, <laughs> knew to a penny how much their dividends were going to be, but yet didn't know from where the dividends were coming from. So history from our perspective. And in the historical realm, um, oh, it, it, it's, it's their birthright to know their history. And, and as a school district, we had been depriving them of their history. And through the loss of our storytelling, we had been depriving them of our creation and origin stories. Within the historical realm is a uh, core theme of Unipkat Kolektot and Ukaluktot, which are the three genres of, of stories that, that as seen through the Inupiaq world view. <clears throat> we have North Slope history. How did the borough get formed? What's land claims all about? What's AFN? Uh, what are our regional corporations? And what role do our village tribal governments, et cetera, et cetera. And then our place uh, um, in a global perspective, historically, where, where do we fit and how do we fit and how do we look at our place in society today from a historical perspective. In the individual realm, there was a lot of discussion around maintaining balance in today's day and age. And, and I think uh, the, the essence of spirituality really comes into, comes into play when we think about what it is we need to be able to do today to be able to maintain a fine uh, and distinct balance given, given the technological uh, advances that are being made, given our need to continue to our identify ourselves as, as Inupiat and navigating in, in the, the so many global um, cultural domains that, that, that exist 
in our day and age, given accessibility to, to, to the information highway, et cetera. We used to say uh, we're walking in two worlds. However, uh, my feeling is that it's the world we live in today that's a combination of, of, of being able to maneuver in today's modern day and age, as well as maintain integrity as, uh, as an Inupiaq person, replete with the beliefs and et cetera. Leadership is acknowledged in the individual realm. Uh, the group felt it was important. Yes, it's important for us to know who our leaders are today and the leadership roles they play, what they consist of, but it's also important for us to also learn about traditional leadership roles. What did those consist of? And how, what are the qualities that make up a good, good leader? In the same essence that there are qualities that make up a good person, inyulluatak. Women's roles were acknowledged, uh, given that um, they've, they've changed over time. Many of our women are the sole breadwinners in, in families, many families, given the limited opportunities for, for jobs in our communities, for example. Our values and beliefs, uh, it's represented, is represented by the by the sun, I'll bring you back to the image here in a moment, uh, represented by the sun on the horizon. Our values and beliefs tell us how we are to behave with one another, how we are to treat one another. And included in that is, is the way we look at the world spiritually. Men's roles. This is um, Glenn Saulak from, from Wainwright. He came to school one time too to tell stories. And of course, we had to use a translator. But the whole idea was, was to, for us to begin embracing the idea that our, our elders hold such vast, um, untold amounts of knowledge. Naming in Inupiaq society uh, is very important. We don't uh, just go to a baby book and go, ooh, that's a cool name. Uh, there is a process. Uh, and a belief system associated with naming. This is my daughter with her daughter and uh, my, my granddaughter, two granddaughters. And my daughter is named after her two grandmothers. Her daughter is named after my grandfather. And the baby you see in the picture is named after her great, great grandmother. And so it is through naming that we're able to maintain this idea that in the life cycle, it's, it's circular. When you are born, you begin with your first breath of life and you maneuver through life having gone, um, turned into um, one who crawls, one who becomes a little girl or a little boy that is then um, becomes a teenager that then becomes a young adult that then becomes into the prime of life etc all the way up until you become um, among the very wise and aged and when when you pass on your name is bestowed on a newborn so life continues <clears throat> I want to um, I'm going to shift to um, more of a discussion as to how we embody, pardon me? Okay, very good. Um, let me, um, I need to switch over to, how did I do that again? Escape. Hmm? Escape? Okay, pardon me. Um, uh, because what I wanna do is I wanna share with you how we're, how we're capturing all of these core themes into the curriculum work that we're doing. The North Slowboro School District, uh, several years ago, after the work that we did to formulate what we're calling the Inupiaq Learning Framework, represented by the, the image you saw of the uh, blanket and all of the uh, realms and core themes contained therein, um, we, began, we began what is what we're calling the Curriculum Alignment Integration and Mapping Effort. And 
Uh, many of many of you are, are probably more than well aware that as as institutions, as schools, we have left the idea of spirituality out the door in much the same way that we have historically left culture and language out the door. Um, as children, I remember going to school in a BIA school, Bureau of Indian Affairs school, and it was as if I had to change my persona because I had to leave who I was out of, out of school. When I walked into school, I had to be this English-speaking, um, uh, English-thinking person. And so as a district, we're, we're reversing that. And rather, uh, um, as a result of the interactions that we had with community members, re-embracing our identity as Inupiaq people, as well as not forgetting that we are a spiritual people. Let me see if I can find my document. Very good, thank you very much. When I spoke about the core themes um, contained in the Inupiaq Learning Framework, we, um, and in the curriculum work that we're doing, we, we took, uh, and, and it, was, it was a really matter, uh, 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 it was really intense, very, very intense work. We wanted to ensure that all of the core themes that were represented came first, first of all, and had the same, if not more, amount of credence that is paid to the Alaska content and performance standards. And so, in the same way that the academic teams, the math people, the English language arts people, the science folks, were developing uh, overarching understandings and essential questions for their core content areas, we did the same thing with each one of the core themes. So for example, hunting and fishing, uh, creating balance, we have overarching understandings for each one of those and we developed essential questions for each one of those. And you can imagine uh, the amount of work that it takes to train uh, teachers who come from the lower 48 who really have no clue about life up on the North Slope. Um, enormous, enormous amounts of, of, of um, in-servicing. And, and we were still really struggling at one point. And, and I guess a, a, as a result maybe of miscommunication because the understanding that teachers were coming away with is that we were expecting them as teachers who came from the lower 48 and didn't know anything about life on the North Slope to be teaching the culture which, was, which is not and has never been the case. So we went through this exercise of having them relate their own experiences to each one of the core themes that I described and that's when we finally, finally crossed that, that hurdle that no, it's not that we're expecting teachers to teach the culture. However, we are expecting them to teach through the culture. And so we've had a series of uh, in-services surrounding that. We then we then decided that akin to the grade level expectations which we continue to have to work with through next year when, when we move fully to the new Alaska content and performance standards, we decided that we were going to go yet a grain size deeper than simply have um, overarching understandings and, and essential questions, but that we needed to have performance expectations for each one of them. And I'm going to show you some examples that embody the idea of language and spirituality. We also decided that rather than have performance expectations for kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, that we would use our way of thinking in terms of the development of a child to dis to discern um, what these performance expectations should consist of. And so we wound up labeling them with three, actually there are four, and, and we're going to work on a fifth. The emerging uh, group, 
grouping is for babies from age from the time they're born until they're about age three. Then we labeled um, the, the beginner level to be children who are around age three or four till they're around age six or seven. Novice would be seven or eight until they're about 12 or 13, and then practitioner at, from, about, from around age 13 till they're around 18 or so. And then we yet have to articulate a master's level, which would be beyond 18, what the performance expectations should consist of. So it was more in line <laughs> in the thinking of, of the Inupiat, where, where, where we look at the development of a child rather than them being in grade one or grade two, for example. I'm bringing up food preparation and care. Again, this is a core theme. And you'll note um, the first overarching understanding has to do with language. And we did this for each and every one of the core themes. We wanted to ensure that we addressed language and that we addressed the spiritual piece. And so I'll read um, what the OU is, the OU overarching understanding is for, um, for the language piece that, that um, captures the piece having to do with language. Culture is embedded in language. Different languages uniquely express cultural understandings and beliefs. And you'll also note that we also developed a coding system akin to the coding system that's used in the Alaska Content and Performance Standards and their GLEs. The essential question that accompanies that is what understandings about the nature of food are clarified through the Inupiaq language? And then the piece that has to do with the spiritual part regarding food preparation and care is in the Inupiaq world view, the spiritual dimension is an integral part of and not separate from all aspects of a person's awareness. And the essential question that accompanies that is are or is, how is spirituality embodied in the preparation and care of food? And the OUs and EQs continue for, for additional dimensions associated with food preparation and care. What I'm going to show you next are the performance expectations that accompany the OU and EQ for spirituality. So first you'll see performance expectations associated with the, with the essential questions dealing with language. And then you will see the performance expectations associated. You'll note on the left the spiritual aspects. And in this case, the student uses knowledge of Inupiaq culture to retell stories that describe a person's spiritual relationship with the food quest. All of our hunting, there's, there's, it's, all of our hunting and food gathering activities have a spiritual nature about them. Tell and, and then as, as they move forward and become a little bit older, then they will tell stories that describe a person's spiritual relationship with the food quest. And finally, when they get older in their later teenage years, about the time they're about ready to graduate, they should be able to tell his or her own stories that express the spiritual aspects of the food quest. Additionally, they will match food items with specific living things, explain the reciprocal relationship between people and the animals that give themselves to people. This gets at our belief that animals give themselves. Describe a hunt during which the relationship between people and animals that gave themselves was evident. Describe or demonstrate how to show respect for the plants and animals that are used for food. Explain why the food from various animals is cared for in specific ways. Articulate beliefs and practices surrounding the care and maintenance of the ice cellar, if, if, if it's locally appropriate. I don't know how much longer we're going to have ice cellars, given climate change and warming. Um, express gratitude to powers beyond him or herself for the bounty of the harvest. Express gratitude to powers beyond him or herself for the bounty of the harvest. 
retell a story that explains the importance of physical cleanliness and spiritual connectedness in dealing with harvested animals, explain and practice proper treatment of harvested animals, and finally treat harvested animals appropriately by showing respect and keeping the catch clean throughout the process. And then if I could go back, that's, that's, that's the example for food preparation and care. We have a language and spiritual peace associated with each and every one of the core themes, and I want to share one more under uh, creating balance with you. Okay, and so for the individual realm under the idea of being able to maintain balance in today's day and age. Um, creating balance, okay, here are the um, overarching understanding for language is the same as we read in the food preparation and care, only the essential question varies. What challenges have today's youth who have not learned to speak Inupiaq? So we have children beginning to examine the psychology associated with not being able to speak or the psychology associated with the boarding school era when language was oppressed, having them really thinking about those kinds of things. And in the spiritual piece, in the Inupiaq worldview, the spiritual dimension is an integral part of and not separate from all aspects of a person's awareness. Again, the same as, 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 is, as is with the other core themes, with the essential question being, how does an individual maintain a spiritual mindset in today's world? And it, it manifests itself in these performance expectations. Identify those aspects of his or her life that are based in Inupiaq tradition. Learn about the lives of North Slope people and identify ways they engage in spiritual practices. Determine whether or he or she feels balance in his or her life and embark on an individual quest for spiritual connectedness. Those are the three um, performance expectations that we have related to the spiritual peace in creating balance. And so we have the spiritual connection associated with each and every one of the performance expectations or, or each and every one of the core themes. Now, how does this manifest itself in the curriculum? A uh, few, okay, few words about that. The, um, the work that we're doing to build the curriculum is based on a model developed by Jay McTighe and Grant Wiggins. It's referred to as understanding by design, and it's actually working backwards from what we know this 18-year-old looks like because of the work that we've done with the Inupiaq Learning Framework. We have a pretty well-defined idea as to what we want this, this, this um, individual to look like. That embodies all of the pieces that, I, that, I've, that I've referred to. And we also want them to excel academically, of course. Uh, in today's day and age, there, there is no other two ways about it. And so um, the, all of, well, not all of the staff, well, all of the staff has, ha, has been trained in how to use UBD as, as the curriculum development methodology. Um, we've had Jay McTie as a consultant um, come to Barrow for, for the fourth year. He'll be coming again next year in year five of, of an initial five-year effort that, that we've undertaken. The first three core content areas that uh, we, we worked on for the first two years were, were science, math, and language arts. We added uh, career tech ed last year, and just this year we have added social studies. And it's very interesting to see how things are, are, are panning out because in, in many school settings, if, if not all, we tend to think in segments. Uh, this one hour we're going to do math. This one hour we're going to do social studies. This one hour we're going to do language arts, etc. However, what this process is, is teaching us is that we must think beyond a segmented regime, but think more holistically, and so many of the units that are being developed 
are turning out to be multidisciplinary in nature. So, for example, in fourth grade, we have a unit that um, teaches about the ecology of the ptarmigan and historically the importance of the ptarmigan in the life ways of the Inupiat. Um, that has a math component, it has a science component, it has a language arts component, and I believe it also has um, geography. Um, all of the teachers have been trained in the methodology and all teachers are expected to produce units that they can then employ in their classrooms. So for example, um, in the community of Point Hope, well, let's use, let's use uh, Ipaluk Elementary as an example. There's a first grade teacher who wanted to teach about the concept of ice and, and how ice is formed and, and, and different properties. You know, ice turns into water, water turns into ice. Those science concepts. And so she used um, the ocean, our Arctic Ocean, as, as the example because kids are familiar with, with that part of the world and then can relate science concepts associated with, with ice um, on the North Slope. The teachers begin by identifying which of the overarching understandings and essential questions they want to hone in on to teach math or social studies or language arts or a combination thereof. And so they begin by identifying a particular piece and it, and it um, could very well be that they want to address one of the spiritual pieces in one of the core themes through language arts or through science or through math or through social studies. They then identified the uh, overarching understandings and essential questions that have been developed for that particular core content area. It might be science, it might be a combination of science, math, or language arts. They then identify the uh, assessments that are going to be used to measure how well a student has, has understood the content. And then they work on identifying how they're going to arrive at that by developing their learning activities for that. The, um, each teacher is expected to complete one unit a year and we're in year four so our uh, curriculum mapping uh, software um, is beginning to be populated and through this mapping software we'll be able to discern to what degree over how many times given a vertical K-12 um, spectrum as well as uh, going horizontally, how many times the state standards have been addressed as well as how many times and to what degree we're addressing each and every one of the um, overarching understandings and essential questions contained in the Inupiaq learning framework. And we can have the software analyze, analyze to what degree we're doing that identify where the gaps are, and then do more unit work that will get us to where we feel that we've done um, an adequate job of addressing each and every one of the uh, overarching understandings and essential questions contained in the Inupiaq Learning Framework in the same way that we do checks to ensure that we have covered the requirements as set forth in the Alaska Content and Performance Standards. So with that, um, I want to thank you for, for being here and I want to again thank my hosts and at this point perhaps uh, open it up for questions. I believe we have, what, five or ten minutes? So, so I entertain anyone who, any questions who might have. Yes, Rosita? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first of all, thanks to Jenna for being here. Jenna is an old friend of mine. And um, when she was showing those historical photos, I was afraid I might show up in those historical <laughs> photos because I did my field work up in Barrow in the 70s. And I wanted to thank Jana, and I wanted to thank the Northwell people for the welcome, you know, that they, you know, they extended to me. I was a, a Clinkett girl up in Inupiaq country, and sometimes the Indians and the Eskimos didn't always get along, so I was kind of nervous when I went up there. But they embraced me, and I had a wonderful time. And I was thinking that 
you know, she said that it's the 40s, 50 year olds who are speakers now. And when my we went up there, my children learned Inupiaq, and they they were they became speakers because everybody spoke. And this how quickly time changed. <laughs> but uh, I have a couple of questions. But one of the things that really comes out to me is, and this is something you see in native native um, uh, spirituality. And I think we use the word spirituality out of respect to our elders who are Christians. And when we would talk about spirituality, they would ex ex accept that. But when we use religion, they were taught about the conflict between Western religions and native spirituality. So it was a way of, a way of getting around this conflict. And it seems to me that you know, you've know you been able to address that with the elders. Because when I was there, there was still this separation between church, uh, those who were Christians and, and mm -hmm. native spirituality. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I have that as a question, and how, do you, how did that transition itself? But this is so fascinating that, you know, uh, you can integrate your spirituality into your curriculum. Because when my grandfather went, was trying to teach here in the schools, he was told you can't talk about culture and spirituality. And he said, well, how could I talk about culture if I can't talk about spirituality? Mm -hmm. So how are you able to integrate your traditional beliefs, your spirituality, uh, into your schools and curriculum without you know, the separation of state and, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and religion? Mm -hmm. How do you address those are the two questions I okay. have. Rosita. Um, Well, I guess um, I, I don't want to say suffice it to say, but uh, we, we go at it from a we're not preaching or teaching kids how to be shamans in, in the first place. Um, in the same way that we don't in school teach children how to be a Catholic or a uh, Muslim or a Hindu. Um, it, it has been a, a fine balance, and it has we, we've had to have been on this path of recovering from the oppression of our belief system. I, I, I struggle with the word spirituality myself. I struggle with the word religion. I, th I think it's, um, it, it limits uh, the concept that, that, that as Native people we have with regard to, to our relationship with, with the world around us. And and, and as you indicated 20 years ago, well, even as, as, as early as maybe five years ago, we had just completed a unit that um, dealt with a high school unit that looked at the history of the oppression of language and the history of schooling on the North Slope. That, that, is, that is a unit we've Im embedded into um, US history at, in the high school level. And in the workbook, uh, we, I, I remember this so distinctly. We were we were presenting it to our school board for their adoption for, for them to approve so that we could adopt it as an official uh, unit to embed into U.S. history. And in the workbook, there was uh, the word um, shamanism or shaman appeared as as a question. And there was this long uh, discussion and debate about whether or not we should include any discussion about shamans and shamanism uh, that lasted probably well over an hour. And, and finally, the breakthrough was, was when I said that we are not training or attempting to train our kids to become shamans. We are, we are teaching them about historically what our belief system looked like, so they can make their own decisions as to what their belief system will consist of. So it's been, it's been a very, very long process. 20 years ago, we had um, a, a good friend who's done a lot of work in Point Hope and had the distinct honor and, and privilege of working with one of the last um, shamans in Point Hope. Um, and he wrote a, a, a textbook for teaching about the history of Point Hope. It was called A Social History of Point Hope. 
and contained in it was a chapter on shamanism and shamans and who they were and what their what their practices looked like and it never got published it still hasn't gotten published and and we're picking that discussion back up 20 years later because I believe our mindset um, has become more embraceive of, of our own belief systems uh, but it hasn't been without without a huge struggle and without a um, without a lot of work having gone into reclaiming who we are spiritually um, and, and every other which way. So thank you, Rosita. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.